Hello and welcome back to the channel guys. I'm Spider Boss. Wait, never mind, but today's video will be on the Spider-Man PS4 game. But more specifically, five comic book details referenced in the games that we see through our playthroughs. Of course, the Miles Morales and regular Spider-Man PS4 and 5 games, but let me know down below if you guys want more Spider-Man videos in the future. I probably will anyways, but other than that, let's get into the first detail. Now, many of you love dogs out there, and so <laughs> there's no better dog to get than one who can utilize interdimensional transportation, right? Anyways, in Spider-Man, going to the financial district, we can find a statue where in our New York's reality, we have the Charging and Bull statue, which represents the power of the American people and the spirit of New York. Anyways, on Earth 1048, there's a statue for Lockjaw, who appeared first in 1965 in the comics of Fantastic Four issue number 45. Personally, I think this is a really cool detail Insomniac added, and, and even better where the Charging Bull statue is in our New York. In the comics, he's associated heavily with Black Bolt, and is used a lot of times as a method to travel across space and time, so a pretty big step up to the average canine. But Lockjaw is such a great character to see in the Spider-Man games, and he's such a great character in the Marvel Universe. Hopefully, he gets a really good live-action appearance soon enough, which may not actually be a big stretch, because with everything that's currently going on with Marvel right now, dealing with the multiverse and such, you never know. We may be seeing him there soon. I personally would love to see that. Now, I know this may be a bit controversial, but I'm kind of done with Kang being the big bad villain in the MCU currently. And I know that recent reports have said that there will be a new villain of alongside Kang in the MCU. Of course, this will probably be Doom, which who we'll talk a little bit later on, which I really hope happens because he's such a great character. Kang's cool, but with the actor situation and the MCU having done a decent number of media on him already, I'm ready to at least move away from him for a little. Not kill him off, I'm <laughs> chill out, <laughs> of course not, but just focus somewhere else. Anyways, let me know if you guys agree, let's move on. Now, this one is definitely a much bigger detail, but still one that got its fame from the comics. Roxxon in the comics has been around since the early 20th century, going through various owners throughout the years. They're an American oil and gas corporation that has ties to Hydra, yet they are some of the earliest funders for S.H.I.E.L.D. So, uh, yeah, they were playing their cards right. And not only have they fought Miles before, but also people like Iron Man and Captain America. Anyways, throughout the games, Miles is fighting Roxxon as well as the Underground, led by the Tinkerer. A pretty decent villain in my opinion. Anyways, Roxxon's main headquarters is indeed in New York, New York, but they also have various other locations. We can actually find a Roxxon building in New York in the Spider-Man games after everything unfolded with Miles, which is pretty cool. Roxxon first appeared all the way back in 1974 in Captain America issue 180. Throughout Roxxon's history, they have funded many evil operations for their corporate greed to a new level. They funded, like I mentioned earlier, Hydra and even some like Mentallo. But every time they do this, it's for their oil drilling operations, or most of the time. Having both factions in the game was great to see, but let's move on. Now, I think we all know Spider-Man's biggest fan. The man who supported him over the years throughout his career. The guy who's been there for his ups and downs, always with him. J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> well, supported may not be the right word, but anyways, a cool minor detail we see in the Spider-Man games is we find out that Jonah has a son, John Jameson III. <laughs> yes, that's his name, but anyways, his appearance is very minor, but Jameson III posts a tweet about how excited he is he was able to hear his father's podcast on the ISS, or the International Space Station, that's currently orbiting Earth. So yeah, his son is indeed an astronaut, as cool as that is, that's not the reason I want to talk about this detail. In the comics, in some renditions, John Jameson III's alter ego is the Man-Wolf. I'll give you a bit of backstory. On a mission to the moon, Jameson found a glittering red gemstone nestled into the rocky surface. He decided to take it back with him down to Earth. After speaking with a quarantine colleague, he decided to make it into a necklace and wear it. Why not, I guess? <laughs> I mean, he's dripped out, but I'd be more interested to figure out why there is a red gemstone on the moon. But anyways, soon the gem stuck onto his skin, grafting itself on. And you guessed it, when the full moon came out, so did his inner wolf. He then turned into man-wolf, unable to control his actions. Within that stage, he attacked his own fiance, Kristen. Of course, I'm paraphrasing and skipping a lot of the story, but I'm trying to do this <laughs> in a fairly cool pace. But anyways, Spider-Man found out, and they had a big fight, blah blah blah, and, and Spider-Man ripped off the pendant. 
pretty gruesomely, throwing it into the Hudson River. Anyways, my point to this was that it was really cool to see him in the Insomniac universe. It would be an awesome DLC character, just villain in the game. Also, a cutscene of him on the moon finding it would be pretty freaking awesome. But again, <laughs> why is there a red gemstone on the moon? I'm more interested in finding out the backstory to that. But anyways, let's move on. For this next one, I wanted to talk about some of the suits derived from the comics that I thought were pretty cool in their backgrounds. Like this one. Wait, no, wrong one. <laughs> the Mark III. The suit first appeared in 1999 in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 682. As you can tell, it's pretty heavy duty, which makes sense because the suit was made to combat all six members of the Sinister Six for the various powers. For example, the suit was electroproof. Um, I'm sure you can tell who that combats and I hope you can. <laughs> and it had a powerful hearing device to be able to detect the chameleon, which is also pretty cool. Now this one, I really like. It's a stealth suit or the big time stealth suit. And this thing looks so good. Oh, It first appeared in 1999, like the last one, in the Amazing Spider-Man issue 650. So just a bit before, but it was designed to be able to counter the hobgoblin screams and turn practically invisible by warping light. It's so cool in my opinion, and I really do hope we see more of the hobgoblin because he's such a great character and one of my personal favorite villains. <laughs> Maybe Ned and the MCU will turn into him. But anyways, for the feared self suit may also be one of my favorites. I mean, look how good this suit looks. Anyways, in the feared self comic line, all the way back in 2010, in the seventh book or issue, sorry, Spider-Man is given a fresh new look by the doors of, give me a sec, Nida Valir, Nida Valir, whatever. And Tony Stark. It was made of Uru metal and could shoot blades out of its arms. I mean, how could it get much cooler? I really do like the frosted look it has. Um, sadly, Odin did get it ordered to be destroyed, but so not too much more of that suit. But anyways, a really sick suit. And if you guys want me to go over more of them in the future, just let me know. Because, I mean, they're all pretty interesting. Overall, all three suits are pretty awesome. It's awesome how much Insomniac cares about the comics and everything that most of their suits are derived from them or the movies, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, it's just pretty cool in my opinion. <laughs> Finally, I want to take a look at one of the embassies in New York, Simcaria's embassy. Now, many of you may know, Simcaria is a famous country in Eastern Europe that has been involved with fights with Latveria, aka Doom's country. It was around during the Balkan War and faced annexation. It's so cool that we can see the actual flag and embassy in New York of Simcaria. But what's strange is that in some renditions of Simcaria, it, it actually fell, and therefore the embassy in New York was closed down, but I guess clearly not in the Insomniac universe. What I found funny when researching Simcaria for this video, actually, was that, was how specific some the databases can get. Like, for instance, under the law section on the Marvel fanbase for Simcaria, it states, A law on the firing of people was passed by the parliament stating that an employer had to have documentation of at least three written warnings before firing an employee. <laughs> then the next section talks about its alternate realities. I love how specific it gets. Um, man, do I love the Marvel database. There's so much I want to talk about for that one sentence. Like, what job? Why three written warnings? For That sounds like an elementary school. But anyways, I think how Marvel set up its world building with these various Eastern European countries right alongside the real ones we actually have is really cool. Like how Latveria and Simcaria border Serbia and Montenegro, but also Transylvania, which is filled to the brim with vampires. Personally, I think it's so sick, and having real countries alongside your made-up ones that are actually pretty similar to real Eastern European countries really may make the lore more heavy and feel more realistic when reading and watching. And personally, I think it's so sick. And while we're at it, I may as well mention that also in New York, there's the Wakandan Embassy, which definitely looks a lot nicer. <laughs> Clearly representing Wakanda well with its technology, but for the Wakanda embassy, I feel like there aren't that many Wakandans outside New York since they've created such a haven in Africa. But I may be totally wrong. It'll be it'll be hard to research that, so <laughs> yeah, it's cool. I mean, anyways, let me know if I'm wrong, but I know there are a few scattered around the world, or a lot scattered around the world, but I feel like they're usually for operations. Anyways, I I usually watch more mainstream Marvel stuff, so please let me know if I'm wrong. Anyways, the last thing I want to talk about on Simcaria is the Wild Pact. So, during the Nazi campaign throughout Eastern Europe, devastating horrors were committed on the Simcarian people. And so the Wild Pact was formed with the intelligence minister Ernst Sablanov, who ran the Wild Pact with the help of his brother, Fritz Sablanova. And this organization became reputable for its discipline, commitment, and parliamentary skill of the long Simcarian martial tradition. Overall, very cool. But 
that's it for this video. Thank you all who stuck around to now. I really enjoyed making this one and switching up from DC for a bit. It was really nice to talk about this and Spider-Man, so it would be generally be appreciated if you guys could give me some feedback and just let me know your thoughts on the video or future videos or not. But anyways, thank you for watching. Make sure to stay safe and I'll see you all in the next video.